this is speaking not towards the solution. This is really covering the issues of why a lot of the proposed solutions in our society simply are not workable. Myself and uh, Mr. Strasburg here, we're both electrical engineers. We've done everything from power distribution to electronics with sensitive equipment to RF realm to patents and in a pinch welding. So we, we do the, the whole gambit of uh, electrical engineering. It's something that we have to deal with with noise online and things along those lines and, and basically just uh, the overall um, the overall process of getting power from point A to point B, the power distribution is, is always a constant problem for us. Uh, clean energy um, and clean being no noise on the line and not you know how uh, it was produced uh, to get there. We always are dealing with the reliability of the overall system and everything to uh, basically mitigate risk and get that uh, the, the time to failure and basically limiting the mo moving parts so we actually are able to go from point A to point B and power the world. In the U.S., here's kind of what we deal with on a, uh, uh, a yearly basis with the amount of coal, nuclear, hydro, wind, geothermal. We've got a, a whole plethora of, um, of resources that basically power us. We choose the one that's most beneficial to us in our regionally specific area. The normal market conditions and everything like that. For us, a little specifically, this one area up here uh, towards the top, uh, this is all the electricity that's generated. 38.1% of it actually is making it to where it's supposed to go. Because there's a lot of loss and things like that when you deal with distribution long distances. We uh, scale things up to high voltages and have low currents to travel long distances. And, what w and as a result, we mitigate a little bit of that uh, line loss. When you actually have electricity that actually gets to uh, where it goes, you have basically 67.5% of it is lost in the distribution transmission. Um, it costs a lot of money for your basically your utility providers to get the electricity from point A to point B. So when we actually get the electricity, you're, the price you're paying for the electricity is actually a result of everything it took to get it there. Um, and you know, clean energy sounds uh, really great. Uh, solar, the sun is free. And if we don't really look at the price to manufacture or dispose, it is a really uh, viable option. Um, basically, uh, one of the problems that we've had with a number of the states um, is basically uh, the states have been, um, the states and federal end of the spectrum have been subsidizing the overall process for putting uh, solar on people's homes. So we basically have gotten a huge influx of solar paid for by various entities so they can compete on a normal open market. And some of the problems with that are the utility companies having to actually pay the full price and have a uh, huge portion of the, the you know, a small portion of the electricity actually make it there and charge on that. Basically, these uh, various uh, solar companies, for example, uh, on my end of the spectrum, uh, we do a lot with putting on uh, uh, solar on people's homes. We net meter it, um, so the utility companies are actually forced to buy it back at the generation rate, which for the utility companies, it actually incorporates their profit margin. So it's very kind of interesting on that end of the spectrum, and that's one giant factor that actually causes the price to go up. We've got several different states just looking at the last three years or so for the utility companies that have a, a lot, uh, basically have been doing a lot of solar and it basically keeps going up um, with uh, taking up uh, various states have pledged to take 20% of the business away from the local utility companies. And as a result, it basically everyone who doesn't get solar is kind of left with the check. So it's kind of an interesting concept, but uh, basically what uh, happens on uh, uh, ultimately is solar companies put on solar panels, subsidizing, uh, heavily subsidized by state and federal governments. And what it really does in the long run is it raises the price enough to where when subsidies actually end, they can actually possibly compete on an open market because the rate is so high they can actually get a cost on return back uh, whereas before it wasn't even viable. Here's some of the storage possibilities that people uh, actually have. Hydroelectric, you have you know various other forms that people are possibly able to use. You see the hydro, uh, the hydro is actually the largest used on here by uh, you know overwhelmingly, and that's tapped. Uh, you've got as much of that that we can actually produce 
at, uh, at one time. Um, one huge problem uh, with these other options are the cost effectiveness has never really made sense, so that's why they've always been low. And we've seen uh, over the last five years, we've seen California and Hawaii at, or over at the numbers that we saw at 38 cents per kilowatt hour, whereas you've got states that, that are actually high in nuclear that are under 10 cents. We're uh, actually doing a, a thing called net metering, which is forcing the local utility companies to measure the amount of electricity that's produced off these solar panels. They're basically the storage bank. So if you put solar panels on your house right now, you basically put electricity into the grid. The utility company is actually forced to store it, and then you take it back as you need it during the day, during the night, whenever you actually need it. And they're actually forced to uh, sell back or buy the extra electricity at the generation rate, which incorporates their profit margin and that's why you see a huge spike in electricity cost for states that are high in solar. The solar panels are actually uh, producing electricity at DC. We actually put on microinverters to convert it from a, uh, DC to low voltage AC and as a result um, we're actually putting it into the grid and we don't have to worry about phase differences and things along those lines. It's, it's kind of uh, interesting because basically it's, it's like someone singing with the radio. If the radio's loud enough, you sound like you're really, really good at singing. So ultimately, uh, once you turn the radio off, you, re you realize how bad you are at singing and leave it to the professionals. So basically, um, in states like Hawaii and California, where you have a huge amount of bad people singing, it really does mess up the song. Um, so in, Cali in Hawaii, for example, 40% of the state has these solar panels. So as a result, all they've done is actually backfed into the grid so much that they're actually looking at burning out the grid. It's actually past, it's getting to be right at the saturation level. So they've started to kind of do their best to cut back net metering, but ultimately, um, in the long run, it's actually beneficial to our end of the spectrum because it makes the price go up and it makes uh, basically it possible to come in very easily with a clean, real energy that actually is uh, plausible in the future. But here's Dodson to talk with uh, the wind end of the spectrum. Alrighty, so that was sort of an economic picture. We're going to look at some technical issues now. How does the grid actually operate? Starting over here. You have seasonal loading. I will actually move flexible AC transmission systems up into the north of our nation in the winter. I'll move them down to Florida in the summer to deal with those variable demands. Um, from weeks to days, you will actually ramp your base load generation up and down gradually. Um, on terms of hours to minutes, we have natural gas turbines and pumped hydro that we use to deal with these minute to minute demand variabilities. Getting on into like single seconds up to 60 hertz, you have issues such as power flow control where I'm generating the same total amount of power but it's being redirected to where the loads are in the grid on a second by second basis. You have such things as torsional interactions and subsynchronous resonance that occur that we'll talk about in a little bit. And then you have at 60 hertz, I'm concerned with maintaining both my frequency and my reactive power within very tightly controlled bounds. And finally, as you go above 60 hertz, you run into issues with harmonics, which are introduced by many ugly loads, such as um, your um, arc furnaces, and even many power electronic systems actually will put a lot of these harmonics back on the grid, as we'll see. Okay, so how do transmission lines actually work? You have a voltage at each end of the transmission line. Between these two voltages, you're, you're going to have a magnitude difference and a phase angle difference. And real power is concerned with the relative phase angle between the line and reactive power is concerned with voltage magnitudes. So as reactive power is passed along the grid, I will see the magnitude of my voltage drop. And as I proceed from my power plant to the far ends of the grid, I will see gradually increasing phase angle shifts. Now, um, a typical line will introduce a certain amount of reactive power depending on how much it is loaded. 
there is something known as a surge impedance limit. It is the optimal loading for a line. We, we build power lines and we determine the amount of power required. It is actually disadvantageous to simply build large excesses of power lines because under their surge impedance loading, they put a lot of reactive power back on the grid causing voltages to rise. This can and does destroy things. Too much is just as bad as too little. Okay, and now let's look at some variations in power angles um, during a typical, Ameri typical American day. Now you can see um, as the colors darken, that's your typical directions of power flow. So here in the Midwest, we'll have gusting and, and some wind production, and that typically is being transmitted out towards the East Coast. And we would like to have this entire grid much more tightly in the green area. We don't really like this massive variability. And for this cause, we're building large numbers, or we're trying to build large numbers of transmission expansion projects with significant resistance. Um, looking at the voltage or, or the frequency and how that changes, you'll notice in Oklahoma, which is a major area where we're deploying wind resources, not only when the wind gusts does the frequency surge above 60 hertz, but when the wind suddenly dies, the frequency dips below 60 hertz. The grid around this area is stable. Oklahoma experiences the most variability. Wind causes problems. Okay, so we're talking about all these renewables. Are there things we can do to the grid to integrate them? Well, um, we can increase line capacity. You can build more lines or compensate existing lines. Um, you can regulate the lines constantly with rotating masses, flywheels. Um, you can direct the power flows um, and you can put other devices. Okay, that will fix that. Um, so this is an example of some studies I've done. This is a series capacitively compensated line. As you'll see, as I increase the line capacitance, I actually get more stable power flow. So I would co compensate my line with 250 megavars and I move the surge impedance limit down to a higher megawatt point. So the same line with a series capacitor on it carries more power effectively to longer distance. But if you'll notice, there's a kind of extra frequency in there. You know, the uncompensated solution versus the more increasingly compensated solution. That's a concept known as subsynchronous resonance. Now, what happens when subsynchronous resonances line up with the resonance of a wind turbine? or with one of the many resonances of a wind turbine. The, the fan blades themselves will wobble. There's multiple rotating masses within these wind turbines. And indeed, if I have a lot of wind turbines in an area, if wind turbine one adds up with any of the resonances in wind turbine two, plus the resonance of my series compensator, I'll get torsional amplification. This destroys things. You know, starting in the 70s, when they first started to interconnect large power systems, they found um, some pretty serious problems. It is very difficult to do the studies to detect this. And in fact, it is rarely done. I mean, when, when they put 500 megawatts of wind in Texas and forget to even build enough transmission lines to carry the power out of the area, I mean, this is far and above. Um, so these are some of the proposed solutions. They have their advantages and their disadvantages. I can switch in reactances and capacitances. I can put in power electronics inverters. Um, you can decouple your wind turbines and your solar um, plants with power electronics inverters, but these are very expensive systems. Um, it's, this is part of my research. The costs are high. I recently got to speak with uh, the, a Department Energy Assistant Secretary, Pat Hoffman. I probably gave my professors a heart attack. This is right before I asked her when the Department of Energy will admit that wind and solar are probably not good solutions. <laughs> um, but I got, I had a candid conversation, got some interesting uh, data out of her. There is not a single transmission expansion project in this country that's not currently being challenged by landowners. 
Um, see how much a, a Texas cattle rancher wants you to pay for running a power line through his cow pasture. Um, from Florida to California, distribution feeders are being overloaded due to home generation of solar energy. We're not storing it, it's just going, it's just getting burned up. And if there's too much on it, then we simply shut parts of the grid off. And they're penalized when they do that. You know, you, you have reliable service providers being forced to accept unreliable inputs. They call renewable energy negative loads. Okay, and finally, many long lines in the Western Interconnect are currently being series compensated. So the torsional amplification issues are only going to increase. Ten trillion dollars in transmission grid upgrades might allow us to start integrating some of these renewable power plants, and that's without a single megawatt being put on the grid. Do direct current transmission lines avoid torsional amplification? Uh, yes, sir, they do, but they require um, power invert. In inverters. Um, um, HVDC is an interesting concept. There's an issue with actually controlling the power flow. Typically in an HVDC line, I'll build my link that will have power flow available in one direction. So bi-directionality is currently being looked at. It can be built. People like ABB are, are doing it. Um, it's expensive. A lot of the HVDC links are actually used to tie in different generation areas. We like to isolate, you know, the East Coast from the West Coast, from ERCOT down in Texas, from the from SPP. And a lot of um, these solutions are simply expensive. If we had nuclear generation located where we needed it, we wouldn't even need a transmission grid. I mean, it's like you can spend a lifetime coming up with excellent answers to the wrong problem. Could you go back to your, uh, uh, your frequency slide? Yeah, there you go, right there. I'm shocked that uh, more advanced analysis hasn't been done. Fourier analysis combined with a $120,000 HP network analyzer should be able to deconstruct that overlay. That's an n-modal frequency distribution, right? And so mm -hmm. how has that not been done yet? Well, it's, it's, out the individual it, it's, it's constructing the model. A single machine infinite bus model has like 27 modes I have to analyze, and that's assuming that the rest of the grid beyond my generator and the bus that it's connected to is just an ideal voltage source. I mean, we, we do transmission studies, but you talk about like it combinatorially explodes. I mean, this is like playing a game of Go. For, for a computer. I mean, w that's one of the very active areas of research is how do we model grids effectively in order to determine, like, can I even put a wind turbine here? We're selling these things to poor folks in South America that don't have a clue what they're buying into. I mean, like, I just, it's a shenanigan, par, par none. So this is one in California where I live. In the price of electricity. Undoubtedly. I mean, it's, it's going to be the reason why you have a blackout at your house. But this, yeah. This, basically, the smart grid is designed to help uh, uh, alleviate certain problems down the line. So basically, it's going to be part of the fix when we're able to kind of compartmentalize and break up the grid uh, to uh, when we do get something like a thorium reactors, modular reactors in various areas. That's going to be kind of the saving grace to kind of help partition things for the solution. But yeah, it's definitely the problem for now. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you so very much. <laughs>